Hi, my name is Nick Palermo, and I am the Metro Capernaum Director in Young Life for Kids with Disabilities in San Jose, California. And I have been doing disability ministry for the past 26 years. And um, I get to talk to you today about um, why we do not have kids with disabilities in our youth groups and churches, um, teens specifically. And um, one time, uh, around the second year we were doing Capernaum, a man came up to a, uh, my booth, it was a ministry booth, and I was advertising about disability ministry. And he looked at the brochure and he said, wow, there's just not much of a market for that. And I was really taken aback by that. First of all, that we were thinking of ministry in terms of marketing, but um, the bigger thing was what the actual case is about people with disabilities. 600 million people in the world, over 600 million, have some form of a disability. If it was a nation, it would be the world's third largest nation and it would lead the world in homelessness and poverty. 15 to 20 percent of the teen population in the United States has some form of a disability and that coupled with the fact that there are 10 percent of churches in the U.S. that are engaged in any kind of disability ministry makes all these statistics pretty staggering. And, um, and then when it comes to teens with disabilities in youth groups, that number would go way, way lower. So um, that, that exposure to those realities is something that really spoke to me as I started doing ministry to kids with disabilities. So I would like to tell you a little bit about my own story in meeting kids with disabilities. I don't have any background uh, in this, not professionally, didn't have a relative with a disability. I've been involved in Young Life for many years, which is an outreach to high school and middle school kids, as well as college now. And I was involved in the Young Life Club as a volunteer, and I went one day to a new campus that I was doing Young Life at. And as I turned the corner on that campus, 25 kids in electric wheelchairs came up towards me and went into the cafeteria. And I was absolutely stunned by that. I'd never seen a whole group of kids in wheelchairs before anywhere. And um, that began my journey. I went to meet those kids and I found out how afraid I was, didn't know what to say, couldn't understand a kid with slurred speech. And I really was intimidated. And um, that went on for about a month. I kept trying to connect with kids, but I kept feeling pretty um, out, of my, out of my league. And right around that time, I was reading um, in the book of Luke, read the parable of the great banquet and when it came to the part where uh, Jesus describes the host and saying go out into the streets and bring in the crippled the lame the blind and the poor it was like a brick hit me I realized I had never read that passage in terms of actual quote-unquote crippled lame blind and poor I'd always heard that spiritualized in sermons or in books or in conversations but I was thinking at that point, I really have friends now in that cafeteria that really are blind, crippled, lame, poor. And so um, a, little, a little phrase popped into my mind, I think that God just kind of dropped in, and it was be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And that was life changing for me. Because then I went back to those kids and I didn't fake it. I tried to just be okay with my feelings of being uncomfortable, and I, at one point, um, couple of kids and I we started laughing at something and it it became normal um, they were normal I was the one that was abnormal because I could not connect with them and in that moment those kids became instead of disabilities that happened to be kids they became my friends who happened to have a disability and from that point we decided we wanted to start a ministry to kids with disabilities and what we did uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later is um, we did a club for them, but we reverse mainstreamed it. We brought some of our able-bodied kids involved in Young Life to their club so that we could build the club around their needs and what works for them while still having it integrated. And it really took off. When I recount my journey and, and starting this, and you know we have grown incredibly over the last 26 years, and I look back at all of this and I wonder why was I, you know, so nervous so unable to connect and I think I think now why is it that in our youth groups and churches around the country are we afraid to have kids with disabilities and maybe you might think well not afraid we just don't know where they are but what, what are, what's keeping us from having that huge number 15 to 20 percent um, of, of teens in our country with a form of a disability why is that not represented in our youth groups and I think it's a number of things I think one is fear I think, um, I know I had fear when I started meeting kids for the first time. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. 
um, a very common thing for Christian parents to hear who have a son or a daughter with disabilities that we don't have a place, we don't know what to do. And that becomes the final answer. We just don't know what to do, so we turn them away. Um, I, so I think, and I think the other thing is we don't, we ask, where are they? I've not seen any kids with disabilities, and that's really part of the point, is that hidden away in many times, whether it's edu uh, special education schools, hospitals, they're out there, but unless we have the mentality as a church to go, as opposed to come here, because they're not going to come. Um, a lot of them will have, have issues with transportation. There's all kinds of barriers for them to get there. We're going to have to go out. Just as in the parable of the great banquet, where the host said, go out into the streets and get the, the blind, the lame, the crippled, and the poor, we are really gonna have to go. We're gonna have to find them, we're gonna have to look for them, we're gonna have to find where they are. So I, I, you know, I look at our growth and uh, we are now in 181, 181 ministries in the United States, 16 countries, and I look back and I go, why has our growth been that way? And I think it's a couple things. I think one is we've really captured a nerve and there are millions of families out there um, with children with disabilities who are feeling isolated, alone. The statistics are for marriages, 80% are single parent families. You can imagine some of the strain and the burden. I know I have three boys and with both parents being intact, um, parenthood is daunting. But imagine being a single parent, more daunting. Then imagine being a parent with a child with a disability, even more daunting. And these are families that are really, and in some cases a lot of Christian families, who are dying for the church to open their arms. To, to say, instead of, we have no way of doing this, to instead say, we don't know how, but we're gonna find out. Maybe you could help us do that. That's, that's part of what it's gonna take, is, is refusing to say no, and being willing to say, I don't know, but we're going to find a way. One of the things we've said in Capernaum um, that we're using as kind of a, a motto is that we want to be the place where the first answer that families hear about their kids with, with disabilities is yes. And that's what I'm really praying for all of us as the church. It's yes to families with children with disabilities. Um, there was a parent one time who uh, in Los Angeles and her daughter had got involved in the very first Capernaum Club there in Los Angeles. And a year later, she was asked to speak at a fundraising banquet. And when she um, spoke, her daughter had been involved for a year at that point. And she, she was a Christian parent. And she said that we had for years tried to find a church where we could go. And repeatedly were told, we don't have a place. We don't have a way of taking care of your daughter's needs. And so they stopped going to church altogether. So then she got involved. Um, found out about the Capernaum Club, her daughter started going, and the first club that her daughter went to, the Young Life leader there, talked about a Jesus who knows your name. So she picked her daughter up, um, they were leaving, her daughter had a great time at club, and about halfway down the street her daughter said, Mom, turn around, turn around, I've got to talk to the Young Life leader. So her mom turns around, they go back, and the Young Life leader's walking out of the house, and um, she rolls the window down, and she says, Nancy, is it really true that Jesus knows my name? And Nancy said, yeah, yeah, Cassandra, it's really true. She turned to her mother and said, Mom, Jesus knows my name. And the mother at that banquet said, we had searched for years for a church that knew my daughter's name, for, for a Jesus who knew my daughter's name in a church and we couldn't find one. She went to one club meeting with Capernaum and we found the Jesus who knows my daughter's name. Sadly, there are a number of parents who have children with disabilities who don't think there's a Jesus who knows their daughter's name, who think a verse like John 3, 16, for God so loved the world means for God so loved most of the world. Is their kid included? They're looking for a place where they belong and that will tell them God is real. There's one really big surprise, I think, in ministry to kids with disabilities that is really, really attractive when we realize it in our youth groups. And that's the impact on able-bodied kids. We tend to think when it comes to ministry to kids with disabilities that it's going to be all of us giving out to them more people power. Um, but what we fail to see is the huge impact it has on our able-bodied students. And I want to tell one story, and this story is very powerful, um, but it's not uncommon. Um, over the years, I have watched thousands of able-bodied kids get around kids with disabilities and have their lives changed. 
Um, this one young woman, her name's Sharon, she was in my Young Life Club as a senior, beautiful young woman. Um, from the looks of things, everything going great, related well to people, I mean, just looked like she was on top of the world. She wrote me a four-page letter um, after her senior year, and what I read in that letter shocked me because I had looked at her as being totally okay, um, looked like she was doing well, and it was the opposite. And she proceeded to describe her life in her senior year. She uh, mentioned, she started with saying that one night she was sitting on her bed and she had a knife and she was getting ready to kill herself. Right around that time, my, my oldest son, Joel, who was friends with her, um, ended up contacting her on Facebook and ended up chatting. And she said, um, Joel, you know, what does your dad do? Because I was a young life leader, but she didn't know what my job really was. And Joel told her, well, he has this ministry called Capernaum and it's a ministry for kids with disabilities. And she said, well, do you ever need volunteers for that? And he goes, yeah, why don't you come on Thursday? So they stop chatting and she's holding a knife and she puts it down and she, she says to herself, I cannot kill myself until I go to that club Thursday night. I'll do it Friday morning. And she goes to the club and during this time also, she described part of what was going on for her. She was feeling intense rejection on the inside. She was in drugs, alcohol, having sex, low self-esteem. Everything you saw on the outside was completely opposite how much crisis she was in on the inside. And so she went to that club that Thursday night and she said as she approached the door, she expected to experience the same rejection she always has in her life. She walked in the door and her next statement was, in 30 seconds, the first 30 seconds I was in the room, I experienced more acceptance from drooling kids in wheelchairs than anywhere else I had in my life. She told no one, but at that point, she just cold turkey stopped the drugs and alcohol. A few months later, broke up with her boyfriend, told God, I want you to be my father. I want to know my mission in life. She went to a discipleship school in Germany for a year after her senior year, and now she's one of our key leaders. And in a number of cases like this, I've watched that there's something that goes on with kids with disabilities that transforms able-bodied kids. But with Amy, it became very clear what we see on the outside of kids with disabilities is disability. A lot of people, that's the first thing they see. And it's what I saw, a disability who happens to be a kid. But with someone like Amy, that disability, she had a disability, but it was on the inside. She was crippled completely on the inside. And I have seen it where there's something there that an able-bodied kid sees, a kid with a disability begins to see what's on the inside and healing begins to happen. Healing begins to happen for a kid with a disability because friendship begins to happen. And so I've always said to people that if you knew what kids with disabilities would do in your youth group, you'd be just knocking at the door to include. They've encountered Christ with one another in a transformative way for both of them. So what are some practical steps that a youth pastor, youth leader can do in terms of having disability ministry start at their church in their youth group. And I think it's simple, simple steps. I know because of my experience that most people, if not all people, when they first encounter with someone with a disability, they go through all their fears, feeling uncomfortable. I know that was definitely true for me. So I say the very first thing is to confront your own fears. I think it's to make a decision. I'm gonna be comfortable being uncomfortable around this. I know there's things that maybe I don't understand or that, or that bother me. I would encourage you to do some reading. There's a tremendous book by Henry Nouwen called Adam, God's Beloved, which is his journey from being uncomfortable around a person with disability to beginning to see them as a person and see Christ in them. So we've got to face our own fears. Um, a, a second step could be researching, finding out where are the schools, where are the places where kids with disabilities are. If you can find a mainstream site, um, possibly where some of your students are going to, or you can find a Capernaum ministry somewhere in your area, I would encourage you to hook up there and begin to be around kids with disabilities, begin to become familiar. Third easy step I would say after that is pick one kid. And here's the great thing about disability ministry. You don't have to feel like I've got to get 30 kids in a room to say I have a disability ministry. It's way, way simpler than that. 
it starts with one. That's the most important thing. One kid that you can get to know. Why is that a big deal? Uh, parents of kids with disabilities, almost across the board, if you ask them, what's the one thing you most want for your son or daughter? They will say friendship. The simple act of friendship that is vacant in their lives. Uh, we've had times where we've done birthday parties for kids and parents have told us, it's the first time my kid's ever been invited to something. You can imagine that. So your simple act of taking one kid and I'm gonna to get to know this kid well, take him out, ice cream, something like that. Sounds so simple, but no one does it. And build a deep friendship where you begin to know who that friend of yours is and they begin to know you and you get to know, get to know the parents and some of the things they deal with. Fourth thing you can do is I would do kind of a little disability awareness thing in your youth group. Begin to teach your students as you learn about your friend with a disability, begin to teach them. And you can do something also that we've done before is a, uh, you can get some wheelchairs and put your able-bodied kids in wheelchairs for an afternoon, assign them a disability, they really um, take that seriously, go out into the mall, uh, maybe experience being fed, do that for a few hours, come back and talk about it, and it will be eye-opening. And if you have a, a kid with a disability or a parent who can talk after that and share a little bit about that world, what it's really like for them, that's a bonus. That's a great thing to do. Uh, so take those steps. Um, then I would say start to bring your friend that you've gotten to know into your youth group and begin to maybe talk to some of your kids about, hey, um, you two today, would you like to be able to be with Debbie today and just uh, help her around, help her get to know kids? You can assign a couple of kids to do that. And this one kid will become a part easily of the life of your youth group. Now, what if more parents, you know, because the word gets around, parents are network, that someone is actually taking my daughter or my son seriously, and it gets around, well, we want to be involved. What if you start to get, you know, significant numbers of kids with disabilities? At that point, there's a, you know, it, to it totally depends how big your youth group is, for instance. Um, you know, you, I think once you get to the 10 or 15 or 20 level, I think that's great at that point to start a club or a youth group meeting for those kids with disabilities and do what we do, reverse mainstream it. Let your kids serve. It's a discipleship thing for them. Let them go and help them to create create the club for them with a, with a music they can, they can do, with a games that they're capable of and, and hearing talks in the way that they can comprehend and understand. That is a tremendous thing to be able to do that will, again, bring discipleship to your students, but also create ministry for kids with disabilities. I wanna leave you with a story that is um, really a special moment for me. It's the signature moment for me as I began to do this that God spoke to me. And I had been um, appointed the area director for the first Capernaum ministry in Young Life and had been doing it for about two months and where our club was going great. We had 21 of the 25 kids in the special ed class on the campus coming to our club. So if you can imagine, we like a school of 2,000 and you have 1,900 kids coming to your, to your club. There was just such a hunger for anything we were uh, willing to offer them. So all these kids were coming to club and we decided we're gonna go to camp like we normally do in Young Life to a Young Life property. And um, I had 10 kids in wheelchairs we were gonna take. And I thought, well, let's see, in the past, we'd taken 10 able-bodied kids. We would take a couple of leaders. We probably need one-on-one -on -one to do this. So we took 10 leaders and I had no idea that we were 10 short. We really need two-on-one for the kids in wheelchairs because they were full care, 24 seven. Um, it was really difficult for one leader to do that for a length of time. And so we went up there, um, never had done an overnight with kids with disabilities. We went to a camp that the, that the roads were hilly with gravel. And if you've ever been with an electric wheelchair weighing 500 pounds, even without the kid in it, trying to get that thing to catch and go up a hill, that was an issue. The cabin was not accessible. The bathrooms were not accessible. All things I just didn't know anything about. And so we went up there, we got there, and the first thing that happened was there was a circuit race game around camp in groups. And you would go from point A to point B, and we would get to point B, and our team was already going to point C. We could not keep up. So then the club started that night with about 300 other kids. We got in that club room and nobody would get near us. And I began to feel 
some of the stuff that my friends feel daily, moment by moment in their life, but I was feeling it because I was entering into their world. And so club ended, we went to the cabin, it was very hard to maneuver around. My leaders that I had were eight college freshmen who were my ex-young life kids. And I knew this much more than they did. And so we're trying to get them ready for bed. It's getting to be around one o'clock. Kids are laying on the floor. We're, and they're asking me, how do, you know, what do we do? We knew so little. And yet, the kids themselves were on the floor laughing. And I didn't know till later. I didn't realize or understand till later. For them, this was awesome. They were away from home for the first time. They were with their friends. They were up late at night. They just thought they had gone to Disneyland. And, but for me, I was getting more and more stressed by the moment. And it's around one o'clock and I'm realizing we're gonna have to wake them up at you know whatever it is, five, 5.36, to get them ready for the day. And I was overwhelmed. And so I did what every good leader does. I deserted. I left. I went to the lake um, that's over there at our camp called Woodleaf. And I just kind of duked it out with God. I just told him, you tricked me. I knew I, I didn't know how to do this. And I just told God off. I told him I'm going to quit on Monday. I can't do this. I was so frustrated, so overwhelmed. And I went back to the cabin. And these great leaders had gotten everybody in bed. And um, I got up in my bunk on a top bunk. And below me was a young man named Antoine, 16 years old, um, an African-American young man with, a, with muscular dystrophy. And as I was dozing off, still steam coming out of my ears, I, I heard this voice, Nick, Nick, and it was Antoine from down below. And I just kept hoping some other leader please hear this. I don't want to answer. And I was pretty much completely selfish at that point, self-involved, and um, nobody was answering. And finally I said, what? And he goes, turn me. I go, turn yourself. He goes, I can't. And I did not have compassion at that point. I was frustrated. And I got down the ladder, went to the bed, grabbed his blanket there like, and I pulled it hard so he would turn. I said, there, go to sleep. Not my best moment in life. And the thing that happened next was um, grace of God. Proof that God comes to us not because we merit it, but because he loves us and he relates to us by grace and by mercy. As I was climbing up, and I got to the top rung of the ladder, get back in my bunk. There was no audible voice, but it just as well should have been because I heard Jesus so very clearly. And it was really simply this, Nick, it was me you turned. It was me you fed. It was me you brought here to camp. It was me you stood by when nobody else would. It was me you brought to the restroom. And I'm just hearing these series of sentences in my spirit and I couldn't move. I was overwhelmed got back in my bed, couldn't sleep, thought about it all night, or whatever was left of the night, woke up our leaders early, and before we did anything, we, I gathered them together and said, you've got to hear what happened. And I told them at that point that everything we do today, washing a kid's face, dressing them this morning, helping them eat breakfast, helping them in the games, helping them meet other kids at camp, trying to make that bridge happen, it's Jesus in the disguise of a, of a kid with a disability. It's Jesus in that wheelchair and I heard Jesus call through my friend Antoine a kid with muscular dystrophy um, so I would say one thing I would say to all of us including myself Jesus is calling his people he's crying out to his people in the church wherever they are and he's saying turn me he's saying be my friend he's saying include me let me belong and I want to encourage you to uh, be comfortable with being uncomfortable, forge ahead, and seek to include kids with disabilities in your life, in the life of your students, in your ministry. Thanks so much for listening.